Yes, I'm a U.S. Army officer. I'm branch special forces. Um, and I've uh, been in for about 23 years. I was a, a prior to that, I was an infantry officer and been to Afghanistan a lot, uh, South America, Korea for a year and um, getting getting close to retirement. So uh, I've had a, a lot of very inter in interesting experiences all around the world. I've loved, loved my time in. Um, and right now I'm actually working on a PhD at NC State, North Carolina State University um, in public administration. And, and really looking at organizational learning, uh, I feel like I've, I've been living in a lab at work, seeing organ how organizations uh, work or, or struggle to work, and, and then trying to uh, learn the theory at school and then see if there's any theory out there that can explain um, some of the frustrations that myself and my peers have seen throughout the, uh, throughout the last probably two decades at least. So I, I am a little careful to think that maybe I'm unique, but um, I do think one of the features of my island, uh, if, if we call it that, um, is that I I'm, like to question everything that we do, but I'm not quick to throw the old things out um, just because they're the old things. So. Uh, really open to new to new things and trying new things if you come to my island i think you would see the the encouragement to to not uh to to not reject new things just out of hand um but in this in the uh in the same vein not very quick to throw out the old just because it's old so so kind of a balance uh you know maybe a skepticism towards conventional wisdom but also an acknowledgement that some conventional wisdom is uh, is actually wisdom, and so uh, so you know hopefully hopefully a balance uh, you know m maybe a little bit of humility in there that uh, that you're you're humble so in in, a, in in the sense that you wouldn't reject new ideas, but also a humbleness to to never assume that just because uh, we've got a great idea on how to fix things, it will necessarily fix things. I would actually encourage people that haven't gotten into design yet to to turn to a few sources that that may be tangential to design. They're not necessarily um, dealing totally in in the design field, but but the first uh, source or reference that I would recommend to people just starting out is a book by uh, a professor named Norma Ricucci, um, R I C C U I C C I, and and Norma. The book is Public Administration, um, Traditions of Philosophy and Knowledge. And I think she does some of the best that I've seen out there uh, jobs of describing what, what she calls, or what I, I guess I've heard other people call a multi-paradigmatic approach or viewpoint. Um, and so uh, it's, a, it's a short book, and it's written in very easy to understand language. Um, so it's not, it's not, it doesn't use uh, uh, some of the more esoteric um, concepts that some academic uh, works use. And even though she does get into uh, things like epistemology and ontology, she lays it out in very easy to understand language. And I think that that book is, is very important uh, from, from a, a fundamental standpoint, because when I think of design and design thinking, um, I'm really thinking about how to approach things from multiple views, multiple uh, frameworks. And so if you don't understand what that means, if you don't understand uh, you know, what, what multiple epistemological approaches are or, or things like that, um, uh, she talks about mixed method methodological approaches. So if you don't understand those things, I think I would turn to that book because it does lay out in very, uh, easy to understand language, 
here's what a researcher, and she comes from an academic uh, background, but what a researcher uh, would would uh, turn to if they were looking to look, uh, approach a subject from, from multiple views, multiple uh, frameworks. So that would be the first uh, thing that I would recommend. The second thing I would recommend is anything by Donald Shern and Chris Argyris. Um, and so that they have done a lot in, in the literature. Um, they've written a lot on how organizations learn, how organizations frame the world around them. Um, and, and so understanding how organizations and how individuals learn in an organization um, and how we put frames around, around things to better make sense of things and the, 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 the pros and cons of doing that. I think that's very, very important to understand from a design framework because I've never been part of a design effort that wasn't an organizational wide uh, or, or at least a portion of an organization uh, wide effort to address some sort of, of problem. And so, it, you know, it, if you're kind of uh, ignorant about a lot of the research that's gone on that's out there on, on how organizations struggle, um, then I think you'd, you'd, um, you'd struggle even, even, even if you have the perfect design approach. And then the last thing I'd recommend is a book by uh, Deborah Stone. Um, it's called P uh, Policy Paradox. And the reason I, I recommend that is I'm, I'm in the military. So when I'm talking design thinking, I'm talking about it from a military uh, perspective. And when the military is, do, is doing the things that they do there, you know, I've never been a part of a military uh, effort that wasn't involved with politics. And so I think Deborah Stone does a really good job, the best that I've seen in laying out the, the paradoxes associated with trying to execute policy. And so if you're in the military or really if you're in any kind of organization that is dealing with politics and you don't understand or you can't make sense of how politics is not this logical, rational, linear type of, of thing, it's, it's actually a balancing of values. It's paradoxical. It's about identity and, and these sorts of things. Then I, I think you, you will struggle with trying to institute design type types of efforts. Um, because ultimately, uh, that there's a there's a policy. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a, a group of politicians that that are 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 somehow involved, and and so th those would be the four things that I would I would offer up, um, and and some of those are more tangentially associated with the design, but I think that would lay a really good foundation to then starting starting to get into more of the the methodology of design. I'm not sure I have a model uh, of design, but what I would say is that, that to me, design thinking, and again, coming from a, a military perspective, um, you know, applying it to, to military operations and situations, my, my elevator pitch on design is, again, kind of what I said before about the multi-framed multi approach or the multi-view approach, uh, mixed methodologies, that, sorts of, that sort of thing. Uh, in a nutshell, it assumes that no situation, um, no one method is conducive to every situation that's out there. So what you'd really want to do is try and, and understand the context of whatever situation you're in, understand its uniqueness, and then look for a method or set of methods uh, to approaching that situation that is context unique, context dependent. Um, and, and one, one way you asked a little, a little bit earlier, what, what would make my Island unique? One of the things that, uh, that I would say for my model, um, on how to do design and design thinking in the military context would be, uh, this, this idea that it's not just a, a way of planning. It's not just a way of, of, uh, approaching something or thinking about it or studying it. It would really encompass everything that you do. Um, and so a lot of people that I've seen uh, use design thinking in a military context will use it prior to planning. They might use it a little bit during planning, and then it's kind of over, and then they go into execution. They might, uh, even, even though I've seen it in our doctrine that you should use design later on 
to help with assessments. I haven't really seen that in in uh, in reality very much. We, we we struggle with, and there's a lot in the organizational literature on why organizations struggle with learning. So we struggle with learning um, and reframing and that sort of thing. But but I would say even beyond that, it's it would be about structuring your organization for the situation. It would be about how do you plan or do you even plan uh, how you think about things, how you execute, and then how you learn. And that piece, you would actually design how you would learn based on the context. Uh, you know, in the military, there, there's probably, I would, I would just throw out this, uh, this percentage off the top of my head, you know, maybe there's 30 to 50% of the time where whatever you have going in is probably good enough. Um, but then you've got this other huge, potentially huge amount of situations where what we bring to the table in terms of, in terms of our doctrine, in terms of our training and education, in terms of our systems that we use to assess things is not sufficient for the situation. And you'd actually have to turn to something else or, or come up with something new. Um, so that, that's my, my quick elevator pitch, I guess, on, on how, I, how I view design and design thinking in a military context. So I mentioned um, that I've I've rarely seen um, organizations that do a good job of learning, and so w- one of the key pieces in a lot of the uh, in a lot of the military design um, doctrinal elements will talk about reframing, and so it's this idea that you you framed your understanding of a situation and then you've started um, operating in it, trying to execute uh, the the things that you think need to be done whether it's planning and, and, and executing and then, and then assessing those sorts of things. And then at some point, you've got some data that tell you that your frame wasn't right. Your understanding of the situation wasn't right. So you've got to reframe. And I've rarely seen, I, I don't think I've ever really seen a military organization undertake a reframe, much less reframe. Um, and, and, there, and there's a lot of reasons uh, that the organizational learning literature talks about why that is. Um, you know, j- just, just briefly, an organization that defines a, an understanding of a situation then starts to become uh, wedded to that notion. And so to then, to then throw that out, to reject it, um, requires humility. It requires uh, people to admit that they were wrong. Um, that can sometimes, depending on, on you know, your personnel system and the way you promote and, and, and reward people or punish people, it, that could be very risky for people to do. Um, you know, generals aren't really paid to come out and say, I was wrong. I made a mistake. Um, I'm not sure any military officer is really, is really paid to do that. And there's not a lot of, of room for that, quite honestly, in, in a lot of our a lot of our systems and processes and, and those sorts of things. So, um, you know, I, I think that putting an emphasis on learning and, and then what, what I think would be unique would be designing one's learning system around the context. So even though the military preaches to reframe in its design literature, uh, it, it doesn't talk about how to set up a, a reframing system or a process or a learning system or process that's unique to the, to the context or the situation that you're in. I think that's, that's very, very important because if you assume what you've got um, is going to work and, and you're never gonna question that, then, then you've got a problem. The other thing that I would offer up is, I mentioned that I think briefly, but. The, the structure of one's organization, to assume one's organization is structurally sufficient for every situation, I think is a very bad, uh, very bad assumption. And so, if, uh, you know, in, in the military, we have brigades. In the U.S. military, we have brigades, and we're very brigade-centric. And we, we've tried to give as much capability to brigades to be able to do most of the operations they need to do. Um, and so the idea is that you know, every now and then, yes, they would have to ask some, some other echelon outside of the brigade for assistance. Um, 
but but for the most part, we like to empower the brigade so they can do most of the missions that, that they're required to do. Now, to assume though that every situation that a military unit would would be facing would be conducive to a brigade structure, to me is 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 just a terrible terrible assumption. Um, so again, you know, maybe thirty to fifty percent of the situations that that a a military, an average military, or at least the U.S. military might face. Uh, find itself in, it might be conducive to that brigade structure that we've already come pre-formatted with. Um, but then, then that leaves, you know, potentially 30, I mean, uh, 70 to 50% of the time where you're, you're not, that's not a very good structure. You need some, something else. Um, and so we don't really talk too much about, about that. We do every now and then set up ad hoc headquarters and ad hoc units and, and cobble them together. But very rarely uh, do we do that. And, and in Afghanistan, what I saw um, was we would bring over a unit and for the most part use them the way they were already set up um, in, in the United States. Uh, and you know they were training for uh, conventional warfare, and then they found themselves in Afghanistan. They were using the same that same brigade structure largely um, that they used back in the back in the states. So those would be the two main things that I think would be unique. I've seen a lot of design efforts. Unfortunately, I haven't seen too many that that uh, seem to, like I said, you know, run the gamut between uh, structuring the organization all the way to to how how you learn, and then over time, um, keeping all of that in place, and and then and then constantly learning. So in in the in the military, we have you know one to two year assignments. Um, our commanders, you know, are, are, are in, in command for, for just a, a couple of years, usually. Um, when we rotate in Afghanistan, we're rotating six months to a year at a time for, for units. And so I haven't really seen a lot of design efforts that, that run the gamut of what I described. But I will describe one effort that I was a part of that, that, was probably one of the better applications of design that I've seen. Um, and it was with uh, uh, one of the special forces groups. They were looking at how they would help the, their higher headquarters um, map out a new strategy. So their higher headquarters dealt with one region of the world. Um, and, and this one region, it was, it was a continent. Um, and they were rewriting the strategy for how U.S. forces as a whole, but then also special operations would would uh, would would interact with the forces and the governments uh, in this in this continent, and then that would guide operations, guide learning. It would guide pretty much everything their their, their pre mission training, everything that they would be doing for it, theoretically uh, you know, two to five years. Um, and so this this special forces group was asked to give some input into how could they change the strategy. There was a lot of feeling, and this was a few years ago, that this one uh, this one continent was was not seeing a lot of of, of um, positive effect of our operations. And so the feeling was we need to change, but we're not really sure what to change. And so this this special forces group spent about two weeks um, applying about. I think it was about 15 people um, to discussing what they would like to do to change and how they would recommend changing uh, the strategy. And so for, for about two days, I think it was, and you're talking about majors, so mid, mid-level, uh, mid-career people, majors, um, uh, warrant officers at, at the mid-career level, and, and uh, non-commissioned officers, sergeants that were you know, like sergeants, first class, Master Sergeant. So, so a good collection from across this special forces group of, and not just special forces, but they had civil affairs and, and psychological operations personnel involved as well. And so a really good collection of mid-career people who had been, who had seen a lot um, within this continent and were at the point where they were questioning what it was that they were doing uh, from an organizational perspective. And uh, one of the things that they thought were was really key 
was they did not get the sense at all that their higher headquarters was learning. And so, you know, they kind of, they described a Groundhog Day existence. If you've seen the movie Groundhog Day, you know, every day it repeats itself. They would go on a deployment. They would work with some local forces. They would leave. They would go home for a little while. They might go to Afghanistan in between. They would have a little bit of a break, train up, and then go back into this, this continent. And, uh, and, and sometimes the same country, and they just didn't feel like anything had changed. So there you know, might have been several teams in there between them, um, working with the same forces, and it was like just starting, starting over. And their interactions with their higher headquarters was not leaving them feeling like the higher headquarters understood what was, was improving, or maybe they weren't improving. Um, in fact, a lot of their metrics for this, this, uh, this continent for most of the countries were, were negative across about a 10-year time span. So, you know, obviously correlation isn't causation, but it, it was really disheartening for these, these folks to have been multiple times into sometimes the same country and, and, and uh, but across the spe- this special forces group in the same continent for a decade, and they hadn't seen progress. In fact, they'd seen, you know, the opposite in many instances. And so they, they wanted to ask, why, why were we potentially not helping? Or maybe we were making things worse. And just the fact that they really couldn't answer that question, they couldn't turn to their higher headquarters and say, you know, wh- why do you explain these, these really bad metrics? Are we connected to them or are we just not having any effect at all? And so after that conversation, they, what they came up with was I thought, I, I thought was brilliant, which was they reimagined their purpose in this continent. And their, their, new, their newly imagined purpose was to assist the higher headquarters in learning. And, and, and to me, that was profound because in the past, when they would deploy to one of these countries, they were given their purpose from their higher headquarters. And it usually had some really pie in the sky language like uh, support democratic reforms in the continent or, or uh, you know, support stability in, in X country or professionalize the military force in, in whatever country they were going into. And, you know, it was, it was so abstract, uh, so broad, that they could never really determine whether they were making progress towards those things at all. And so giving themselves a more tangible purpose and then linking that purpose to what they thought the problem was, which was that the higher organization wasn't learning across time, um, it, it really helped them, I think, give a little bit more of a, of a uh, positive, sort of hopeful attitude towards their, their future missions, but also allowed them to reimagine what they were doing in these countries. So, you know, nobody really, and they admitted this, nobody really thought they were, they were making these countries be better by going over there and working with these militaries. Um, you know, they did, they did human rights training and they tried to professionalize the force, but, but for the most part, you know, they, they were not fundamentally changing these con- countries. Um, and so it was kind of disingenuous for them to pretend that they were. And they really liked this idea of latching onto an explicit mission that they could actually think that they were, uh, you know, potentially going to accomplish, which was learning, which was helping their higher headquarters learn. And so when they went over there in the future, they could imagine themselves as doing things different. Um, so they wouldn't just sit maybe on a base training some soldiers. Maybe they would have a portion of their force doing that. But another portion would be reaching out to locals, just trying to learn about what the locals maybe thought about the, the, the military units that were close to them. Uh, maybe sending people to the embassy, maybe sending people to uh, the higher headquarters of the partner force they were they were working with, um, so it really broadened their idea of what they were supposed to be doing. Um, it, it it allowed them to reimagine themselves, and and I thought that was that was probably one of the best ways I've seen of of an organization trying to to uh, you know address a complex situation, give themselves something that they could actually you know be tangible that they could they could uh, sink their teeth into, and then also fundamentally reimagine what their purpose was.
What, what excites me about the future is that, and, and there's an old song, if, if, if you, uh, you're into reggae music back in the 70s, you might, might know Johnny Nash, but he sang this song called There's More Questions Than Answers. And, and as I uh, am involved in the military, as I'm involved in designing efforts, um, as I'm in, involved with my, my PhD studies, that, that song, I'm constantly reminded of that song because every time I come across something new, something I didn't know, some kind of insight, it just explodes in my mind all, all kinds of new questions. You know, I, and so it's, it's this idea that um, the, more, the more we know, the more, the, you know, the, le- the more we find out, the less we know is what, what what's, it's, is in the song. And, and the way humans think, um, the way organizations behave are, fascinates me. Um, and, and so the, you know, the more I learn about organizations and, it, and to me, it's, it kind of underlines that I, it, it reinforces that idea that, that you have to be humble. You have to have some humility because, uh, you know, what, once you think you've got something figured out that something else comes along and says, well, you know, you, you might've had a little bit of something figured out, but there's this whole, this whole other piece that, that is still unexplainable, um, and so that, that excites me. I, I, I really think I'm excited about learning, excited about discovering new things, things that surprise me. And it seems like the more um, that I get into these, these topics, um, the more I'm surprised. So, so that, that's exciting to me. And, and uh, the, the projects that are out there, that uh, you know, there, there, there are a lot of militaries, especially um, outside of the U.S. now. So the U.S. has been um, doing a lot of this design thinking and design stuff in Canada as well, Australia. But now it's starting to explode outside of the U.S. And so um, and the, the Republic of Georgia, a lot of the, uh, the uh, Western European, uh, I mean, Eastern European nations, um, uh, all, these, all these countries are starting to reach out and, and say, okay, what, what is this design thinking stuff? Um, we've got this complex problem, and you know we're not sure that the design thinking would help us, but we don't seem to have anything else. So let's try it. And so there, there just seems to be a lot of interest in how can we think about things differently? Can we apply some of the things that are outside of the military, such as such as design, um, which which obviously didn't come from the military, but can we apply some of these tools to these? Uh, complex problems in new ways. How can we do it? Um, I really think that the the uh, the military way of doing design is very underdeveloped. Um, so I'm I'm very excited and encouraged. I think that's a huge area that can be explored. Um, you know, j- just uh, just describing why the military's tools, normal tools don't work is not sufficient. You have to say, okay, well, what's an alternative? And I would say that there's not a lot of alternatives out there. There's, there's the design thinking framework. Um, but then there's a lot of room, I think, in there for developing new tools or, or military um, centric tools borrowed from, from some of these other disciplines. But, but honestly, I think a lot of it will have to be really unique and new to the military. I don't, I don't think a lot of it tra- uh, transfers very easily. So, so I think there's a lot of, of uh, room in that coming up. And, and even now, I'm excited about all that. Um, and uh, I, I've, I've been, I've, I've, I'm starting to see a lot of design. That there's, there has been a lot of design articles with respect to the military lately, but, uh, but even books now. And uh, and my my research, my own research uh, for my for my PhD is is focused on design in the U.S. Army's uh, doctrine, and so I, I who knows I might turn that into a book as well. I think the biggest misconception within the military is that design is either operational design or it's a three-step method that is really tied to uh, architecture. 
Um, so the, the three-step method that I learned at the School of Advanced Military Studies, when I first was introduced to design, was this idea that supposedly borrowed heavily from, from architecture. And that was that you would first frame your, your understanding of the environment. Then you would focus in on defining the problem. And then you would offer up some solution, some solution ideas. Um, and so that, that, to me, a lot of people think that is design and that's it. And there's no other way to do design. And it's all about problem solving. And, you know, you're not going to do that. If you don't need to solve a problem that's kind of complex or unique, then you don't even need to do that. Um, and then the other, the, 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 the piece that I mentioned first, operational design, in the military, operational design is, is associated with campaign design or linking tactics to strategy, strategic objectives. And so there are actual elements of operational design, like center of gravity, lines of effort, culminating point, end states. Um, and so, so there's kind of a, a, uh, a recipe for doing operational design. And so a lot of people will conflate those two and say, well, design is just operational design. Um, to me, design thinking in, encompasses both of those and then a lot of other things. So again, if, if, you're, if you're using, in my mind, uh, design thinking as a, as a multi-paradigmatic approach or a mixed methods approach or a multi-frame framework approach, then you wouldn't necessarily a turn to operational design, but you wouldn't reject operational design. You would use it if it was conducive in your mind to the situation that you were that you were looking at, and and similarly for the the uh, the three step method of design that I that I first learned at Sam's, I wouldn't reject that, but I wouldn't also use it every time that I was faced with a complex problem. Um, so that that's kind of my idea of of you know it's it's not one or the other. It's it's yes. It's <laughs> It's all those and more, but it implies that we have to understand the pros and cons of each one of these these tools that are out there. Um, and you know, I would I would throw rational decision making, which in in the U.S. military is called the military decision making process, MDMP, or the joint operations planning process, which is a rational decision making process. You know, gather information. Uh, select some courses of action, pick one, and then, and then go. It's kind of the framework. I would not reject those either. Those would be part of a design approach. Again, if it was consciously used because it was considered uh, the best tool for the, for the situation. And, and so, so to me, that's, to me, the misconception is that you've got to just pick one tool. It's, it's a different tool or it's this, this one uh, set of steps. Um, to me, it's, it, it it's none of those things and all of those things. And so the more tools you know and the pros and cons associated with those tools and then consciously applying uh, one of them or, or even more than one of them to a situation based on on one's understanding of the situation and then an, a, 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 a willingness to, to reframe, a willingness to admit that we're wrong, whatever tool that we use may not have been the best one. And so or coming up with a, a another tool um, during the reframe, and 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 really a willingness to to maybe be creative and come up with our own tools, um, and that's very difficult. There's there's I, I would probably say I'm not even sure I've been in a situation in a learning environment or or in a practical a pr you know a, a practice a, a praxis environment where we were encouraged to come up with our own approach, you know, invent, invent a, a method. Um, and I think that is, that is very important for, for organizations um, that are dealing with, with the complexity of policy, with the complexity of, of warfare where, where objectives are, are very nebulous and, and the effort doesn't seem to be something that can be accomplished just militarily. Um, I think it's very important for those types of organizations to be very used to, to, to be very familiar with coming up with their own, their own methods. And, and that's something that we really, I, I haven't seen that at all.
Yes, um, and and I'll, I'll paraphrase this this with uh, this was probably one of my first experiences with bureaucracy, and so you know when I when I first heard the word bureaucracy and when I first when I first uh, encountered it, like most people, I thought that that was an evil word and it was bad, um, and and you know, I should be a knight in shining armor fighting the evil bureaucrats um, that are getting in my way are getting in the way of progress. And what I've learned since then, that there's a lot of literature on bureaucracy and bureaucracy is simply following rules, an organization that follows rules. And so you, you know, you can imagine a spectrum between really, really following rules at all times and not a lot of room for, for getting outside of the rules all the way to maybe like a startup company that, that has no rules and they're just, they're just you know, flying by the seat of their pants. And so bureaucracy would be more bureaucracy would be towards the rule following organization. And so once I started to get into literature and understand, well, there's probably reasons that you want the military to be somewhat bureaucratic. You know, you want people with guns and nuclear missiles and these sorts of things to, to follow some rules, right? You don't want them just going off and doing whatever they, <laughs> they want. So, so there are reasons that politicians and, and, and you know, members of a democracy who would want rules, rule following to be more of a norm uh, for an organization like that. So, so once I understood that, I, I was still faced with the, the problem of sometimes you have to get past the bureaucracy um, to accomplish things. And so uh, one of the things that I was faced with early on was that we had some money that was supposed to be spent on a, on a weapons program. And it had already been approved um, to be spent, and we had not asked for permission to spend it in a year. And so, you know, once the bureaucracy, once the rule following organization um, has this, uh, you don't, you didn't spend your money. They they want to take it away. And so, uh, I found the money and and asked for permission, and I was told we couldn't we couldn't spend the money on the weapons program because we needed to revalidate what we wanted to spend the money on. And so I just kept running into these bureaucratic problems. And as the year wore on, we were going to lose all that money to a pet project, a, a new sniper system that they wanted. Instead of spending money on this, on this other weapons program that was about safety certifying foreign weapons that we had, we had recovered off of the, uh, off the battlefield, Afghanistan and Iraq, et cetera. If we, we, you know, if we had an AK-47, for instance, that we recovered off the battlefield, we needed to make sure it was safe before we used it. So we had this safety certification program that required a lot of high-tech tools and that sort of thing. So uh, banging my head against the bureaucracy for, for almost a year, I, I finally turned to uh, some inspiration in our unconventional warfare manual. So our unconventional warfare manual talks about how to uh, support insurgencies. And so, you know, one of the key things in this manual is building rapport with local leaders and the, the local forces on the ground and, and having a network, building a network so that they can influence and, and, and by proxy, you can influence what's going on without a network, without a support network, without people willing to give food or support or vehicles or whatever. You don't have that network of support. Um, a network that helps you tell tell you what's going on if they're they're bad guys. If you don't have that network, then you really can't do very much. And so I started reaching out to my network, you know, friends or, or people that I'd worked with in the past, and um, and and just asking them questions. You know, here's my problem. What 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 do you recommend? And I, I stumbled upon a guy who I had worked with in the past, and he was a trusted friend. And he I told him you know my frustration, and he had just uh, uh, moved into a position where he set the agenda for my higher headquarters uh, monthly monthly chief of staff meeting. And this is a very important meeting where they they teed up subjects for the chief of staff to make decisions on. And either he would decide or he would bump it up to the general. And he said, "Well, let me let me, let me do this. Let me slip you in to the next chief of staff meeting coming up in a week, and I'm just going to put your name in there." And I'm put. I'm going to put weapons program 
And then you just be ready to ask him to grant you permission to spend the money on, on, on the safety certification program. So, I, so I showed up and I, I reached out to my network and I had my boss there. I had a person that would execute the funds if we got permission to execute them. I had a, a weapons expert there that could answer any, any questions on weapons because I wasn't a weapons expert. So I, I had everything laid out and everything was ready to go. And I had anticipated that the one bureaucrat would, would throw up the red flag that we needed to revalidate everything. And so I had someone from the even higher headquarters come in who, uh, who, who could say all of those things are valid. And so the, the meeting came and I, I stood up and gave my pitch to the chief of staff. Uh, he turned to the, uh, to the, the bureaucrat that was blocking me and, and, you know, it, it all fell into place perfectly. Everybody stepped up, said what they said, what they wanted. The chief of staff said, okay, uh, I give you permission to execute the funds. And so we executed millions of dollars to, to safety certify weapons. And it was all due to uh, utilizing a network, which came from doctrine that, that we use normally for you know, supporting insurgencies. And so I was, I was using it in application um, to, to deal with my higher headquarters. I'm, I'm not sure of a biggest goal. Uh, you know, I've, I've got two, two teenage sons and uh, I haven't gone crazy yet. <laughs> so that's a huge accomplishment. Um, I, I'm, I'm a special forces officer and uh, I've been deployed for, for a total of about four years away from, from my wife of, of, um, of, uh, 23 years. And, and the fact that we've made it through, there's, there's a lot of, of, uh, military guys that are suffering from, from all kinds of issues, PTSD, traumatic brain injury, um, guys that didn't even make it back at all. Um, and then, and then just, just mental issues and having, having, uh, lots of stress, haven't, haven't been able to make it through their military career without it affecting their families. Uh, my family, you know, you know, praise to, uh, to God, I, we've, we've managed to make it through 23 years and me being gone four years and, and a lot of that in combat zones without it affecting negatively my, my family. And, and I'm, I'm still with, with my wife. So those are huge accomplishments. Um, the, uh, the engagement I've had with a lot of foreign militaries, especially the Canadian Forces College, I mean, the Canadian military, the Canadian Special Operations Command, um, but also many other militaries. Um, I've been able to, to use my network and then, and then my background uh, of learning design and then trying to apply it with reaching out to others to learn from them and then, and then to give them uh, my two cents. And that, that's just opened up a huge, a huge world for me. And, and again, raise more questions than answers, but, but in a good way, in an exciting way. Um, and the fact that, uh, that I get to wrestle with really, really tough questions, um, you know, you know be, being in a room with a bunch of people who collectively are way, way smarter than me. And, and a lot of them, are, are way smarter than me on an individual level, and they are struggling with how do we uh, assist some country that has, you know, for for the longest time, struggle with simple uh, quality of life issues for their people. How do we do our little part to make life better? You know, that's a very tough question, um, and and to be able to wrestle with those questions and try to put thought into them and try to, to come up with ways that we might at least learn how, how we're not um, necessarily doing, doing anything or, or, or maybe not doing good. That just being in a position to, to be able to do that, I think is a huge, is a huge, uh, you know, 
notch in my belt, I guess you'd say. I don't know if I if I wouldn't have read Deborah Stone's book, A Policy Paradox, I probably would be uh, not able to laugh through much, much of it. Um, you know, every day I find that I find humor in some of the things that I see, both within my personal network and and within you know, the news and the media and the, and the coverage. Um, but it, it simply underlines to me that people are not that, that they don't make rational decisions. People make decisions because of values, and those values are tied to our identities, and those are tied to how we frame and make sense of the world. And so when you tell someone to do X because it's a rational thing, whatever, whatever that, that uh, logic is, is rooted in, um, then it has to go through some kind of filter. Um, and that filter is, is multi-layered, it's complex, it's dynamic, it changes all the time, but it, a lot of it's rooted in uh, you know, our, our identity, our values, and how we make sense of the world. And so you know, I used to, before I understood some of those concepts, I used to look at someone and if they made a decision I disagreed with, a lot of times they were evil to me. Um, and now I understand that, that people make decisions, I make decisions, um, that Yes, people can look at those decisions and think, well, I, I so uh, vehemently disagree with, with your decision that I'm going to not like you and think you're evil. <laughs> um, but I realize now that, that you know, we're all like that. And, and so it's allowed me to see the COVID-19 situation and the responses of different governments and people, not, not in terms of a rational uh, you know, evil or good kind of framework, but more of a framework that makes sense to me. And and so, you know, when when our when my higher headquarters puts out a uh, not my hair higher headquarters, but when a <laughs> army headquarters might put out, for instance, a, a, a message on Twitter that says you need to get vaccinated. Um, understanding how some people in some groups will will process that. Uh, because of their values and their identity and the way they frame and make sense of the world, now allows me to understand why those reactions happen. Um, why in one headquarters you'll get people that don't want the vaccine, and so they're they're literally walking around the hallways trying to find somebody to to stick because you know some of those the way they store them they've got to be used that that sort of thing. Um, and whereas other headquarters they don't have enough because everybody wants it. So, so to me, it's, it's, I've been able to understand a little bit more on why, why it's not uh, necessarily going the way it, it, you know, everybody thinks it should, or certain groups think it should, and why, why there's, you know, a lot of different ideas on, on what the right way to go is. And again, it comes down to values. And, and if, if you don't understand that, if you don't understand the, va- the way people frame the world uh, largely based on that, that that value construction, then I think it's easy to get pulled into the us versus them, your evil kind of argument, which which will never work. Um, which is funny because I've always been told, you know, don't get in, into an argument with your your spouse because if you win, you, that's not really a good thing. <laughs> I, you know, it's easy to sort of understand that, but now I even more understand it, especially on a political level. And so I, I think uh, I think for a public administration researcher or a design thinking person, I think COVID nineteen is a is a really interesting opportunity to try and see how how all of these things that that uh, you know, I've heard from the design thinking literature is playing out in real time, and and how if you don't take a multi frame view of this, then you're actually potentially going to make things worse. If you think everybody is supposed to see it the way you think, it's going to fail. So those are some really uh, interesting insights to, uh, to apply some of the design thinking tools to, to a current problem, a current situation. 